This the 50th episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today we've got a treat for you. We're talking with Jeff Cronin with ASC. Um, he is the DP of many fantastic films, you know, your Fight Club, Gone Girl, uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Social Network, uh, One Hour Photo, uh, a whole bevy of music videos, um, really amazing ones, you know, ones you've probably seen the old, during the old MTV era. Um, I was, re- you know, I was really looking forward to this chat. Jeff is a, a, a DP who um, really influenced my cinematography and my eye for um, image making. So uh, very, I was very excited when his name came across my desk. Um, I, you know, <laughs> hadn't, since I know a lot about his work, uh, a lot of the research was already done. So um, I'm hoping that this interview comes off more sean evans from hot ones and less interrogation but uh, <laughs> uh we had a lot of fun you know we talk about obviously being the ricardos the film he was there to promote um and just a ton of other stuff you know the film look um you know influences his influences um things that he has influenced we talk about the volume and the mandalorian we kind of all kinds of stuff in this one um really think this is going to be worth your time so i will um be quiet now and let you get to listening so uh please enjoy my conversation with jeff cronin with asc normally uh i kind of like to start these asking you know how did you get started and all that but i feel like that's probably been there's about a million <laughs> podcasts or, or asc uh, articles at uh, answering that I did want to know, you know, for um, being the Ricardos, you have mentioned that like uh, your grandfather and um, what's the other guy's name? I looked it up. Earl George Harrell. Harrell. Or Harrell, uh, George Harrell. Or George, George Harrell, yeah. Uh, how they um, kind of inspired some of that uh, look that you were going for. And I was wondering, um, did you, did your grandfather's, uh, sort of photography rub off on you? Did you do any like still photography growing up or do you still do it? I did growing up, of course. Um, but I wasn't very aware of my grandfather's work when I was young. I only came into light kind of in light of it later. Like I always knew he had done it, but he'd retired the whole, he was retired the entire time I knew him while he was living. Um, and, uh, it was only after like, I got, I got stuff in, uh, from my father, uh, looking through stuff with my dad, and then he gave me certain pictures and works that uh, my grandfather Eddie did. <clears throat> and then I did research and, and found certain books and learned more of the history of of his work. Um, and then who was working with him at the time, which was you know the guy that made the most out of it and was able to kind of capitalize on it was George Harrell. Um, very stylized. I, I think all the guys in that era, you know, obviously some better than others and <clears throat> as, as is life, uh, uh, embraced this kind of style that was kind of cool. It was, it's not really a term, but fashion noir, like they took, they took these risks and they used hard light and they had someone stand in a specific spot, you know, a little easier than me having to do it with a moving person, but, but uh they kind of brought out the essentials and created these moods and made this starlight kind of magic images um, through kind of manipulating it. The exact opposite of, of, of realism and, and uh, you know, somebody that finds themselves in, in gorgeous light. It was very manufactured, but it, but it had this great style and it made them, you just saw stars, like they were bigger than life. And uh, in being the Ricardos, I had a, like a great opportunity to kind of have to transverse three or four different uh, eras. Um, you know, we had 52 essentially where the movie takes place. Uh, uh, and then we had flashbacks to when Desi and Lucy first met, which was in the early forties. We had uh, the interviews, which took place somewhere in late eighties, early nineties. Uh, and then I had the, what she manifested in her mind uh, which became the closest thing to the actual I Love Lucy show in black and white. So it was kind of fun to define those and find out what they would be. 
and then and give them their own language. It's always a challenge when you're making a movie and, and there's flashbacks or there's history or there's flash forwards and how do you define those and how do you more able allow the audience to take those journeys with you and not get confused. And so the black and white for the I Love Lucy so was a given. That was what it was, you know. Um, I think Aaron Sorkin was brilliant in that it was never really the show. It's not the broadcast. It's only manifested wow. in in Lucy's mind when she's trying to overcome comedic hurdles or challenges. And so she flashes back as to how those would get resolved. And we actually show the actual scenes uh, as the, as you, as most people remember them. Um, and then for the early stuff, since black and white was gone already, and I didn't want to get too contrived. I just thought like, Hey, it was the forties. This is what my grandfather and Harrell did. It has this own kind of magic look. It'll be, scary and challenging to try to do it and um i think it worked like it i, I liked it it was yeah, really fun yeah. <clears throat> there's uh you had mentioned uh you know references being like obviously too many girls and cuban pete and and baton and stuff right and uh you had said that um you were looking at how they motivated the story at the time mm -hmm. and i think that uh that hit me because um I've been kind of preaching a lot on this podcast about how technically correct is often, you know, page one, day one of cinematography. Like once you get yeah. that, it kind of goes away and then you really need to go by feeling. Correct. And, uh, and I think that translation of what they, you know, um, what motivated their lighting at the time versus what you did, uh, would be a fascinating translation. And I was wondering if you could sort of elaborate on, on those feelings and what they were doing versus the modern um, analog to those. I think there's a lot of talking points within that, within that paragraph, because for me, when I, when I, most of the time when I talked about it, I was talking about the I love Lucy show itself and, uh, and what they, and how it was presented. Um, because when I shot the black and white footage, which again, you know, we were liberated to not have to actually match it to the footage of the, of the, I love Lucy show, but it's always just something you ponder your mind. Like, what if I did do that? What if I shot it on black and white film? And what if I used the, what if I found the real, the cameras that they actually shot with the old Mitchells and I actually used the glass from that era and I did it and it looked identical to what a 1952 person watched on their very unsophisticated television at home broadcast through the air with antennas, you know, rabbit ears on top of the television. I could do that. And that would be a great experiment and a lot of fun to do. Would that resonate with an audience that grows up watching Game of Thrones and dragons fly through the air and are, are, are 10 times more advanced technically than anybody that was on the set of the I Love Lucy show? So I always feel like, ah, it's a toss up. Like, what is that the thing to do? Or because there's such an advanced, educated audience, viewers, do you owe them uh, more? And and in this case, I talked to Theron about it, and I just came to the conclusion that uh, there's been so many beautiful black and white movies in the last few years, and they've captured a lot of Oscars lately. Uh, the audiences are so clever that I would rather, in that case, uh, use the red monochrome cameras, which are dedicated to black and white that come off as, you know, as elegant as the most silver laden black and white film you could have got back in fifties, uh, 25 ASA. And, and I had a little more contrast and I had a little more highlights and I pushed it a little bit, but it stayed within the family of what the show was, but it just was a little modernized. And I think that that was fine. Um, but to your earlier question, uh, Again, it's like one of those things when you're doing, when, whenever you're doing a period piece, you ask yourself, uh, why did they do it that way? And many times you have the smartest men in the room at that time using the best equipment of that time, but they're, it's, it's insignificant by today's standards, like the advancements today and the things that we can do today. So their motivations came by the limitation of the, of the, te of the technology that they had at their hands. And then they created great kind of wraparounds and workarounds to get around those situations. And we're still, you know, the good movies are good movies and you're engaged by the story and they limited the camera movements or they created things that were distractions. So 
bumps or mistakes weren't as apparent. I, I mean, when you go back and analyze them now and stop frames, which you were never able to do before, you can find all the mistakes and things and you can find mismatches and stuff, you know. Uh, I think uh, I think one of the things that is disappointing in 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 any time uh, industries advance is the lost knowledge, and 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 then with that lost knowledge goes the appreciation for what was accomplished before that. And by that, in this case, I mean like when we used to time movies, we sat in a room, a theater, and there was a footage counter at the bottom. And it's dark and you have a piece of paper and a pencil and you see it comes up and uh, at 110 feet into the movie it's two points two red and two points two darks so you had red green and blue and you had lighter dark that was it two knobs you know and somebody would lean down and write it down and by the time you looked up again you've gone four shots past that mark and now you're at you know, 200 feet or something. And you got to go, Oh, well, uh, we got to go back eventually and then do this. And so <clears throat> you didn't get to bring up four images and place them all together and analyze and add contrast and take away and a thousand colors and power windows and all these things to make a match. They matched and pretty well, but it was a lot of it. It was through reciprocity. You, you, you saw the last image, it changed. The next image came up and it was not jarring and you were into the story and there you go. So I, you know, I want to embrace what they had to go through, understand it and then not break it, but modernize it and bring it to a new light. And then for us, you know, gosh, uh, you know, this phone, does more than what, you know, the astronauts got to the moon on, right? And so as far as uh, educated audiences go, you you have to be on your toes these days. Like you can't make mistakes because uh, people will find them and then you'll get a list of a thousand things that didn't match or were wrong or this or that or any of that stuff, which is deservingly so, you know. In the end, I guess you have to ask, did you enjoy the movie and were those distractions? And if there were distractions, then that's a problem. But if you enjoy the movie and got lost in it, then you've kind of done your job, you know. And I'm saying collectively, not me particularly, but all of us right. who, who contribute to it. <laughs> yeah, there's... Uh, I'm it, kind of meandering around in your question, so I hope... Uh, well, this is a meandering podcast. Feel free okay. to uh, elucidate as far as you feel prudent. Um, there's some <laughs> good old SAT words in there. Uh because it's a it's a fascinating counterpoint to something I see a lot in um, current filmmaking. Maybe not all. Maybe not at uh, maybe your level or like TV and film, but definitely at the indie range or, or filmmakers coming up. This like ob uh, obsession with replicating what is often referred to as the film look, but seems to be more nostalgic and more pastiche than uh, replicating what was being done at the time like you were saying you know like what where the technology was limited why would you relimit yourself unless trying to do an exact replica or just like go shoot on film if you really wanted but um and even then would that be lost would they would that be appreciated that's what you have to weigh like are they going to look at it and go why does it look so grainy and like milky or oh great job it looks just like it did or i i don't know what the reaction would be but those are the choices you got to live with when you're making them yeah. Um, you know, in, in the sort of interviews I've seen, you were, you had given credit to uh, Carl Freund for the inventor yeah. of the light meter for every, mm -hmm. I got, I still yeah, he did. He, he, yeah, exactly. Well, only the, only the ballpark, only the incandescent part, not the spot. Meter I have, part. Yeah. I have, I have a really, I have a centimeter too, but I, I yeah. don't know who can fix it. So <laughs> it's the, the guy, one of the guys, I just got an email the other day. One of the guys who we all used that I used back uh, when I started working for my dad first in, uh, in the eighties, uh, George, gosh, how old is his last name? He was the meter repair guy and he, he was old when I met him and he just retired this year. Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> I, I, but he's got to be over a hundred. He's got to be close to a hundred years old. Oh, uh, but he repaired all the Minolta's and all the incandescent meters and the spot meters and all the whole range. I, I don't know now. Someone's another DP sent me an email going, what are we going to do now? And I'm like, I don't know. 
Great question. Yeah. Um, but he, he seems like, you know, being the DP on I love Lucy and, and, and Metropolis and all this stuff seems to have a very, um, forward thinking nature about him. And I'm wondering is, you know, who, who's his analog today? Is it, is it David Fincher? Is it Steve Yedlin? Is it, uh, you know, um, John Favreau? Like who's, who's pushing as the far as Carl Freund, you mean? Yeah, like the way that because, he was because he was it. more he was you know that. he was a cinematographer. He did direct a couple movies, but he was a cinematographer. He won an Oscar in thirty seven. He he was born in Germany and kind of was came in the expressionist German expression movement over here. Found himself doing big movies in uh, in Hollywood and eventually became known as one of the technical wizards. Like he was always pushing boundaries and wanted to do new tricks and new processes to get place. And in fact, when he retired, went into and created this kind of think tank, if you will, for filmmakers to, to create new ideas and solve some of the issues that they had. Um, and because of that vast kind of technical knowledge and, and known for always kind of overcoming these obstacles, Desi, to his credit, who was a very bright businessman, uh reached out to him to kind of come and try to uh solve some of the uh, challenges that this new show was going to create and w w the, the problem with the show or some some of the things from the technical aspect is one he wanted it to be beautiful and television wasn't necessarily beautiful uh they wanted to shoot in los angeles and most shows were shot in new york and th the reason being is uh, the shows uh were presented live they didn't record them uh, and if you were in New York City, uh, you got a live live show. And if you were anywhere else in the world, you got a kinescope, which was the live show being broadcast with a film camera aimed at a television screen, filming the television screen to be rebroadcast around the country through the affiliates. So as you can imagine, the what is quality legging <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Yeah. But that was that was the way they that was the only way they had to do it. Uh, that was the best way to do it at the time. And so uh, everybody else other than in the New, New York area got really a degraded version of it uh, and at a different time. And Desi had this notion that he wanted it to be equal quality for everybody watching it as high a quality as it could be. And at, at the same time, you know, or, or within whatever the time difference was, but not weeks later. And he didn't want to, they didn't want to shoot in New York. They wanted to be in California. So those things came to light. And so what they decided to do was to shoot the show live. Uh, they'd shoot it on film, which was a added expense. Even then was an added expense. And Desi said, I'll take, I'll pay the, Des Lucy and I will pay the price for the, the cost of the film, but we get it afterwards. And they're like, sure, no problem. Well, there goes, there, there, there went syndication. Never would happen today. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, I'm sure you're aware of this story, but George Lucas, when he made the first Star Wars, you know, uh, there was not a lot of faith in it. And he put some of his own money up and all he asked back was that he got all the marketing and products, right? right? Come on, man, like, Who's going to want to buy your fucking toys? <laughs> essentially, right? And that's billions of dollars. And so that's gone too. That's never going to get waved away again either, right? Yeah. So, uh, And so... Uh, more challenges. How do you make them all look good? How do you <clears throat> do three cameras at the same time, which, you know, is, is very difficult from a cinematography standpoint, because normally you'd key from certain directions and now you've got to have all your covers at the same time. And Desi thought that the performers all worked better when there was a live audience. It was funnier. So now how do you not block an audience, light, light them beautifully, shoot three cameras and, do a do a, a show that is uh, the level that he's expecting to do, and that's what they all figured out, and that's what Carl came in and, and solved a lot of dilemmas. And what I support, what in my research of that film, you know, the fact that they used to give tours to uh, uh, DPs and tech companies, and everybody would come to watch how they're doing this magical show, and and if you want like a statement of how good they were at it, essentially that's how they shoot them today. Right. Three cameras, overhead lighting, live audience. It's the same. It hasn't changed much. Uh, so they nailed it. And the, they did things like uh, they had intercoms between the, the you know, hardwire intercoms, headsets to the operator and the dolly grips. Cannon stick, were, yep. Or cannon, cannon rope. <laughs> yep. Uh, cables everywhere. 
uh, script supervisor who acted kind of like a tech AD on a live show where she was giving like, you know, okay, push into here. It's all been rehearsed, but they would do these moves and kind of juxtapose. And then occasionally they would change setups and change camera positions, but he could do it within two minutes and reset. And then, you know, they would, I think the shooting time was under an hour when they actually did the show each day, half hour show. And then later, uh, Desi was watching dailies and, and they'd have like a week or two to put them together and then they'd air. Uh, and he, he didn't understand why he couldn't watch all the cameras at the same time, you know, which made sense. And so Moviola and Carl worked out this system where they put three reels and three Moviola screens together so that Ricky could watch them live, much like, uh, uh, you know, you watch a football game and he's calling out, go to camera two, go to camera one. Go to... Well, he was doing that editorially on a Moviola back in 52. Yeah, it's it's really awesome. <laughs> like hearing all that because like I grew up in the era of syndication for sure. And like, you know, I Love Lucy was a staple. Um, and it's just crazy to think that how that's, you know, this is maybe hyperbolic, but like that was the Mandalorian of the time, (laughs) you know, like just, that's a a, a great analogy. It's a great analogy because I've been invited many times to go down and, and watch through the ASC or different things, Mandalorian. And I, I've actually shot four commercials on the, on the A volume, you know, the LED roundwards. So I kind of got my feet wet on that already, but, uh, pretty amazing. yeah, that um, the the volume seems to be born of like, you know, if you, you watch and I am also a child of DVD extras and, uh, you know, stuff like all the process shots that uh, Fincher's done recently kind of are like mm-hmm. a mini volume. Did, mini volume. Can you draw a version. line from there to there or they did they kind of uh, no, diverge it, somewhere that's and fair. Come together? I mean, that's fair. I, uh, we, we've done that for years. It evolved, you know, it started off with green screens. Well, actually on Fight Club, we had rear screen projection and, and screens. Right. And that's what you did, you know? Uh, and then uh, by the time we got to uh, Social Network, he and I, um, we were doing green screens and or interactive lights. And then we started shooting, uh, I think we did one with some projection on the screens and then digital projection on the screens and then it went into led panels where it was the same footage of the that the background plates were projected on it that were out of frame you couldn't shoot them yet because the pixels were too big on the led panels but you could shoot green screen and have just out of frame that light source so the light source that was actually outside the windows was actually lighting the people and it all matched right and then we got into when the screens got finer it just became those screens uh and then you know, I, he had talked about it years ago, uh, creating 20 years ago about creating a green screen set uh, that only occupied or lit the field of view. Um, in other words, like if an actor's walking across, you're panning with that actor, only within the frame lines is the green screen lit. The reason being is if you have someone walk 100 feet and you pan across that green screen, a hundred feet of green screen is going to wrap all the way around their entire body and their whole face is going to be green. It's going to be a nightmare to kind of suppress all that and get rid of it. But if you only have the parts you're trying to cut out lit all the time, it's a piece of cake, right? So that's, you know, that's what the volume does now. Not only is it those led panels, but wherever you're looking is the part that's illuminated the most and you can either add or take away uh, around it. Or in what when your in in what you had brought up uh, when you're doing process stuff for cars, then you're inside the cars and it's an amazing thing because everything has surfaces on it. You know, Claudio Miranda did it and Joe uh, Kaczynski did it in Oblivion in that they built a glass set, yeah, had screens outside the windows, projected the screens and everything was reflected naturally or at least what you saw. So that was. An earlier version of that. I actually just rewatched that like a week ago. It's great. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a great little film. Um, what, what was your kind of, uh, do you see that the volume is kind of being, I can't imagine it's, I don't see it like taking over all filmmaking, but kind of, where's your, where's your head I've heard people say, you know, make 
proclaim like everything that that happens in life when something comes along it's the right. answer it's how this is make, the future it's this Bitcoin. is how we'll make every movie now and it's like uh no that's not how we're gonna do it however it is a fantastic tool that can accomplish a lot and i think that we're still discovering better ways of using it you know i've done it with sets and inside cars and partial sets like someone like a hockey rink with uh, the glass in the foreground they check and then they skate oh. off but, but they skate off to the led panels in the background teflon floor a little bit of uh, dry ice and, and smoke and okay. for all inter- and i did it dramatically as i usually get stuck doing or or i can't help myself but do and uh uh it looked amazing like you felt like you were in an arena and because you know it, you first see it I first see it because I'm sitting there. I'm like, uh, okay, I don't know. And then, boom, the guy comes up, crashes against it. There's the, the streak marks on the glass are lit by the stadium lights that are not real, that are in the LED coming back at us. And the smudge, and he takes off, and the particles of ice are backlit, and they skate away. And there's not a second that you don't believe that you're in this intense in ice hockey rink and got the shot that's really hard to get. Yeah. So, so, but you know, you can't do, you, you can do the inside of a car chase, but you can't do the outside of a car chase. You can't let the right. car t- wheels touch the ground at the moment. They have to animate, you know, eventually they're going to have floors, but you still would have to either lift the car, spin the tires, animate the car, the tires later. There's all kinds of stuff that has to evolve, but you know, even Mandalorian and, and I have not visited that set. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I know they have a huge green screen back lot area with sand for open fights and day at work outside. I know that they combine it. Um, I know that they're very clever about how they utilize it, but you know, you're, you're never going to do driving Miss Daisy on that set. Right. Right. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to be outside. You're not going to have the interactiveness. You're not going to have, heartfelt stories you're gonna make amazing backgrounds and interactive and anytime you got reflective surfaces a ship a submarine a car whatever you can put people in those things it's going to be fantastic yeah the, yeah that was kind of where uh i can't remember who i was speaking to but we we were ruminating on like wh- what's the future because the impetus for that conversation was like oh camera technology at this point is so amazing you like you were saying you can practically pick up a cell phone and it's yeah the best you know and so we we're like, well, where's what's the other technological push? And we were like volume. But I was like, I don't think like that first season of Mandalorian is like all volume. And then once they pushed away, especially in the Boba Fett show, it's like, yeah, I think they're using it a little, maybe not smarter, but um, what I think is going to be more the future. Okay, is like well, interiors. Hey, let me ask you this question. If uh, if that was the answer and there was a movie called Dune, wouldn't Dune take advantage of that place if that's how you make sure. movies now? And they didn't. Right. So it's, it's for some stuff and maybe they did utilize the, I don't know, actually, maybe they did do some stuff in the volume, but all the pictures I've seen in the schematics and the visual effects, it looked pretty, they were out there in the real world and they were making things. And I think that's what adds the grandeur and the beauty to have. It's always funny when you're dealing with something that's not real like that and suspending reality the more reality that you can have that people have a tangible thing to touch, the more you believe the, the stuff that's not real. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I hesitate to say it's always better to do it in camera, but it's certainly the audience. It's a little quote that I've kind of stolen from John Mayer of all people, people was uh, the, your head might not know, but your heart will. That's, you know what? That's a great line. It's yeah. true. It, it's the feeling of, things that get you um you know I, I really loved how how you modernized uh so to speak the look on being the ricardos i remember there's this photo um it, i actually figured out it's in a book called hollywood in kodachrome and there's a photo of uh of uh lucy and it's uh, it shocked it like shocked me when i saw it i don't know like five years ago and it's the most modern photo I've ever seen of her. Like it's a close up. She's like putting on, it's not lipstick, but I don't know, lip gloss and it's in, it's in Kodachrome. So it's bright color and it's just not lit in that sort of forties way that we're talking about. It's very like, it feels like it was shot yesterday. Right. And I just remember staring at that photo forever because my brain couldn't comprehend (laughs) how like this person who I've known in, in black and white and looks a certain way was 
a glamorized, you know, cause you don't necessarily, I think you've spoken before about how like, or someone, maybe it was the production designer. Um, John, right. John, yeah, uh, John Hutman. Hutman about yeah. how she was a, a very a, a sexy feels dirty, but you know, a, yeah. a very sexy lady. Uh, well, and this, this film kind of touches on that. Uh, but just, yeah, it absolutely hit me. And so the only thing that's made me feel like that is this film where I'm like, there's, yeah, that's the, that's what it would look like today. That's today's thing. Um, uh, and I, I did see that Sorkin kind of reached out to you and was like, I kind of want to build on the look that you and Fincher and made, um, sort of with him in, involved and stuff. And I was wondering if you could, um, expand on what that look sort of maybe technically is, but like, uh, technically, well, but also what it ended up being for this film. Yeah. Well, let me, let me say this. It, I didn't take it as him pointing a finger at a particular image because sure. I, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I look at all those films and I feel like each one kind of has a different look. There's not, there's, there's a weight to it and a weight to the shots and, and the light, but they don't look, they don't look alike. At least I hope they don't. Um, <laughs> I do not uh, think they do. No. <laughs> okay. Well, that uh, someone else can tell me that, but I, I don't, I don't think they do. I think cause we had different equipment, different approaches, different mandates that we gave ourselves to, to uh, approach each one of those. Right. But what I think Aaron was suggesting is he's, he's blatantly honest and he undermines himself all the time. Um, he's the master storyteller and you know, you're, you're hard pressed to find anybody in the world that will make a more complete script. And, and by that, I mean like you read it and it sings to you because it opens up creativity because you see how tight it is and he's made such a world. And now you can go in there and break out all the pieces that you can add to. Whereas sometimes you read it and you're like, I know we got to fix that. I know this isn't worked out yet. I know that doesn't make sense. I know that this is a problem. Don't worry about that yet. And this and that. And um, so with Aaron, he has that down, but he's on, you know, this is his third film and he's evolving and growing as a director and he loved the sensibilities that Fincher and I did. Uh, he loved the kind of weight of, of the looks. He liked the boldness. He liked the camera movement. Um, and I had heard from, you know, his producer and, and editors and different people that I had talked to. And that was one of the things that, you know, he, he criticizes himself and wants to grow as a filmmaker. And so that was, I think that was the overlapping mandate. Now, with, with Aaron, um, he has so much dialogue in a short amount of time um, that you can't, it, it, that's, that's why like in West Wing and some of those shows, they had those long hallways where you can get three people in a shot and walk down six corridors and talk for five minutes and it's all cool. There's no coverage. Everybody's present in the frame and it's got some energy because you're roaming around the world. Get a good I one of those in I, this film. What's that? You do get a good one of those in this film. I we, yeah, the, we did the walk one. and talk popped up and I was like, yeah. Yeah, we had to do one, but it wasn't, it, 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 they didn't present themselves that often. Yeah. And, you know, he didn't want to be a stereotype of him doing these long talks in order to Desi and Lucy. That seems like the intimacy needed to be more grounded than running around like that. So, totally. I mean, yeah, so we did, we brought Javier and the whole gang all the way down from his office to the studio and that, that was one. And we brought, uh, we brought uh, JK and, and Nicole across the street to a bar. And that's basically two walk and talks that, that we did. So now you have this situation where you have a lot of people talking. It's a lot of uh, intimate kind of personal convictions, either, hiding or coming out or being shadowed and and i and we we wanted to keep the camera moving as much as possible oftentimes with writers if they hear the words and see two people deliver them that's fine they would be happy if two people were sitting at a coffee table and just talked for two hours that would be fantastic but as filmmakers and as a cinematographer it's my responsibility to try to put more weight on those words, evolve these characters, get into their minds more, see their perspectives, their fallacies, their insecurities, anything that's going on. And by doing that, <coughs> excuse me, it's lensing up, it's, it's camera movements, it's blocking and staging. 
And so with the absence of these long moves um, and talking with the cast about these challenges, what we did, uh, and I had two amazing operators, Peter, Peter Rosenfeld and Lucas Bilan, two, two of the best. And, and, it, and it's just by fortune that they both were available and both agreed to do the, do the show. Cause usually they're both a camera guys and they, they took the letters off the cameras and just did them as operators. It was so amazing. Uh, is that every scene we tried to get the, we talked to, uh, Nicole and Javier and JK and Nina and all of them and said as much as possible. I mean, again, there's writer's rooms and there's table read throughs where people are seated, but when any time someone wasn't seated or when there was an opportunity to get somebody up and move so that we had to come around and it's not camera movement to move the camera, it's camera movement to stay with the actor. There's a difference when they stop, the camera stops, when they go, the camera goes. Uh, so now we're connected. And so now it's not an arbitrary thing. It's a functioning thing that evolves the, the, the story that shows you more of the room that these people are in. It shows you the distance or closeness depending on what the conversation is eliciting from them. Right. And so that was a, that was a good challenge to do uh, without feeling heavy handed and getting in the way, which is easy to do if you're just trying to move things. And so we just tried to, rather than push the camera for no reason, we always encourage the actors to try to block it in a way us to help block it in a way where, and, and of course that's what I do with light too. Like, you know, here's a dark corner that there's no light in don't stand there. Let's do it where you come over yeah. here, look yeah. out the window and then go cross over Javier so that I have to go around this way and land this way. And this opens you up to this and does this. And there's simple ways of making it more interesting, you know, just as an example of, of what I thought last year or the year before was brilliantly done is Queen's Gambit. Uh, the oh, camera movement, goodness, yes. the camera movement in that is sensational. Uh, and, uh, Steve uh, Meisler, who photographed it, um, was my focus puller on social network. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, my email, like, oh, my God, dude, how did you how did you move the camera like that? And who where did that come from? Was that all you? Was that you and the director? Like, brilliant. And 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 to think going into that, you have like 80 chess matches you have to photograph, you know, and keep them keep us interested, interested the whole time. And uh, I just thought they did a, a marvelous job. Yeah, the uh, man that that spurred like four different questions in my head, because uh, a just on the point of Queen's Gambit, I remember watching that and just going like, "This is one of the not as an insult because this sometimes can come off as an insult, but like one of the prettiest shows I've ever seen." You know, it was just no photographed so good and like Beautiful. the era was there, but as we're saying, like still modern. It was like I agree, Chef's Kiss. Um, I'll go back a little bit before getting into production design. Um, when we're talking about your lighting sensibilities, it's always something I really appreciated about your work. Um, and uh, I was wondering kind of like, you know, that as, as you've said before, like that dark for darkness sake seems to be popular now, but I'm wondering how you achieve um, that appropriate darkness. And uh, you know, cause the, the sort of soft contrast is just so pretty. And um, I'm, I'm really interested in how you well, approach those. Like the, for instance, the, the initial table scene, yeah. Like the contrast there or, or specifically, I remember the shot where JK is talking to Javier and uh, they're talking about being afraid. And there's just this one yeah. shot of of JK that, I, that there's like a cigarette in the background. It's just that one was like <laughs> very exciting. I just went, yay. <laughs> when he got up at the end of that, uh, Javier leaves, JK gets up and we did it twice. And he walked like onto the Lucy set. And I'm like, oh, my God, the, the door is open. You're backlit like god make the right turn go to the door right and the second time he did it but for whatever reason that they liked the first take better and he doesn't walk out but that lonely shadow he was the only one left and his long long shadow walking out would have been <laughs> it was yeah. like, like i saw it it looked amazing <laughs> it never made it in the movie but uh you know that that happens too but uh I had this idea early on and I presented to to Aaron and he said, go for it. And it was, and it was just a basic premise about this movie. And it was to have the, have contrast that merits the subject matter. In other words, when they're heavy scenes, it should be down. And uh, when it's not, then don't, not necessarily, there's a richness to it and a palette that we, that we sought. 
but uh but i thought the idea of like rather than things falling off and letting people be alone in the dark i thought in this case be, because the set is iconic because it's half the scenes in the movie take place on that stage with that iconic set in the background since it's the center of her universe and where she only found happiness was in that set uh which were one of the my favorite scenes of the movie where she lets it all out at the end yeah. um that it was important to always know where you were and to have depth of the sets and in that depth you find loneliness too because it's his massive spaces uh and so i, I lit all the walls i put little tiny practicals in all the catwalks up above i i had washes everywhere so when it was dark it was still dark but you didn't it wasn't black dark there was something back there and then by shallow depth of field bring them out of that so you never lost context of where you were and the vastness of this place and these little people who were pouring their hearts out <clears throat> but you isolated them by shallow depth of field and so that was kind of the idea of that you know you, you go into something like that and then every scene all day long there's things trying to take that away or you have to kind of st hold your guns and 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 protect that and so i think we did a pretty good job of that you know i i'm certainly guilty of doing dark movies that's half of the stuff i do is is not very bright but uh, I always feel like that it has to come from a place in, in the story first, you know, Dragon Tattoo is a very dark story and it's cold and it's winter and, and the, the coldness and the winter were part, were almost equal characters as Daniel and Rooney were. And so you needed to know that and feel that. And I felt like that, like the, the shadows and the unknown and stuff was important in that movie. Um, I don't know fight club was its own beast, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> we can do a separate part. I'm sure everyone you've ever talked to has been like, "We can I have you for about five hours to talk about that?" Uh, I, I, I don't mind talking. I love it. It's it's it's. Uh, I'm I'm a lucky person to get to do this for a living. So, yeah. No, that's. I mean, as I said earlier, like that that one that was one of the films that watching it, I was like, "Oh, I didn't know where we were allowed to." Do. It was like that in the Matrix. Both like hit me in the in the like artistic button, and I was just like, right. "Yeah, this is my stuff," you know. Exactly. And now it's everyone's stuff. I thought I was original because at the time it was like niche. And now the internet made, we're all the same now. <laughs> the hive brain. But people still, they, people still uh, uh, surprise us every day and bring things to light. And you're like, Oh, what? Yeah, you can do that that way. I never thought about that. Or I, you know, I, I loved, uh, I love uh, handmaid's tale, you know, and I, I uh, yeah. started the first couple episodes and, and he, they always put like a practical light out of a window that looked like a source that it was. And I'm like, Oh, it just pissed me off so much. Like the first two shows. And by the third show, I'm like, where's the light? Where's the light? I want to see the light. I want the light. Where's my light, you know? Yeah. And it was hysterical and I loved it. And I'm like, you guys rock. And uh, I don't know, it's, it, you know, there, there is no rhyme or reason. You can always change things up. Right. That's what that's, there's a thousand ways to do it. And and uh, sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. Yeah. I mean, that's the sort of punk rock se sensibilities of uh, things yeah. that I, that I really appreciate is finding, you know, finding maybe not the appropriate lane. That's not the right word, but like finding what'll work. Like you're saying for modern audiences, what are they going to like? And then shifting them, giving them something that they didn't know they needed. That, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, but it always starts with story. It's always about story. Yeah. That's what my dad started me with. And, and, you know, we're here to make the stories better. And uh, uh, anything after that, then you're, it's, it, then you're, you're fantastic, but it's supporting the story first yeah, and not getting yeah. in the way of it. You know, it's really easy to do that. In, uh, but this is a cinematography podcast. We're going to talk about lights. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I did actually, to your point about windows, a uh, lot of window play in this, in this film, uh, there was. big sheared up windows, yeah. Um, was that just a, you know, big piece, whack of diffusion, big light source back there and then nothing out there? Or was, how are, no, how are the depends, windows working for you? Depends on what, where we're talking about. But the, other than the I Love Lucy set stage and the Too Many Girls set, everything was practical locations. Oh, so, okay. So a lot of that stuff was in the Ebell Theater in, in Hollywood, third floor up 
you know, giant windows. And so uh, I had to make choices about that. I, I loved the idea of it being predominantly natural light and then artificially like wrapping things to, for cosmetic reasons, you know, but staying right. within this tangible thing. I loved the colors were beautiful, strong, but soft. And uh, the wardrobe was so great. And hair and makeup did yeah. a wonderful job. And John Hutman and I, you know, it was such a partnership. It was really fun to do. Uh, but I had to maintain that. So since uh, technically you asked about it, they're giant windows in, in all of those, all the offices and all their dressing rooms and all of the writer's rooms. And so obviously you know, shoot there for five days in a row. You can't, the light changes all day long. So I literally made boxes as big as the windows, uh, about four or five feet deep had giant sources in the boxes and then pushed them right up against the windows so that it was my light all day long and would only change when I wanted to change. And when I wanted harder light, the bottoms were open and I had uh, 18 Ks coming through and it was softer Then it was all wrapped in and boxed in. And then at night we changed out and had little twinkle lights in the boxes. So you saw points of light out through and oh, sources nice. coming in. And uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes the best, I mean, you still have to have an idea of what it's going to look like and how, but the way that you get there is, is sometimes mandated by the, by the circumstances that you're in, you know, um, mm. it was a tough parking lot to deal with and cranes and trailers all stacked on top of each other in the back. And every night it was like a, one of those little puzzles we used to make where you just slide the pieces around and get the other one in. Uh, so it was, it was good. Another sequence is, uh, this was a fun technical challenge is Lucy walks in on, on uh, uh, Vivian wearing a dress for a cocktail party. And then she thinks she's going out on, on the town and that she wants to wear it for one of the scenes. And they have that discussion. It's a great room surround oh, glass surrounds two, two thirds of that room. Um, but there's nothing outside. There's no way of accessing outside because it's tiered roofs. And then it's in a courtyard that doesn't allow you to get condors and it's too far of a reach. And so I hung uh, these LED panels outside the windows. There was blinds and then draped duvetine over those to stop the sun from coming in so that I had some element of control over it, you know? Um, there's other times where there was a hallway where JK and her stop and they're talking before he drags her to the bar. It's, it's like, a, it's a massive hallway. It's a 150 feet long hallway with windows on one side with the same courtyard problem and no access to it. So that's one of those situations like, okay, I can't control this light. Um, at four o'clock, the sun will be on this side. It'll be indirect. I, I'll tomorrow before we shoot, I want to read this and balance it. There was fluorescent lights in the ceiling. I added NDs to them so that they, you could see them, but they weren't doing anything. And then you have to shoot at the right time. That, yeah. that was, you know, uh, this, it was, this was a movie that had a decent budget, but it wasn't a big movie by any means, you know, and uh, you got to get everybody on board and go, can we shoot this in an hour and a half? Because after that, I don't have control of this anymore. It's going to change a lot. Yeah. otherwise it gets enormously expensive. And so you weigh those things and hope that everybody uh, is on board, you know, and, and you have to, that, I mean, that's part of it. You know, you, when you figure out what the budget is and you look at your scenes and you look break the script down and you go this day, I need the most help. And for me, it was uh, out in the, when they're doing the swimming pool scene, when they're talking about her getting the part in us in, in, uh, I love that scene. That scene, uh, uh, the location that they, we, we lost one location, we rejected one location, uh, ended up at this place and we're in the middle of shooting by now, you know? And so we're scouting on a weekend and I look at it and it's like, <laughs> this is going to take all day to shoot this. And the sun is actually horrible. It's, it's it like, we can't shoot here. It's like, Oh, but then it's like, right. Like what, what do you need to make this work? And I'm like, I need like a 40 by 60 rag to block the sun. And that was, that's a giant crane and the whole thing. And uh, we did it. So like me letting that hallway work allowed me to get this 
piece of equipment that I needed to do that. And then weirdly we shot it and Aaron wasn't happy with the interpretation of the performances and wanted to do it again the next day. And one day, I can't remember which one, one day it was hard sunlight. One day it was raining, oh, but geez. because, but because I had that rag, we were able to kind of manufacture and I had to do a lot of trick trickery when we were doing our DI to make, cause it, cause then he doubled crossed me, you know, I'm like, okay, <laughs> we can do this, but promise me. And I only do this in the most loving way, Aaron. He, they used, and I kind of knew they would, they used shots from both days. I'm like, no, cause it's so different. Uh, but, uh, it, it, it worked out, you know, it worked out. And, uh, I was, it, it was imperative that we had the, that, that rag to help us make it through that stuff. So, well, to your credit, I thought that was a set. Oh no. Not, yeah. I, I could, well, especially cause you know, there's the classic, uh, uh, double backlight thing going on. Yeah. That was <laughs> and, on purpose. Uh, <laughs> I figured, yeah, it fits the tone and it fits the era yeah. and all that. And, uh, and I was like, Oh yeah, yeah look, it's a, it, I just figured it was a set, but that's, uh, that's incredible. Yeah. It's out in Chatsworth. It's a, it's a beautiful sprawling ranch. Yeah. Hummingbird that, ranch. Oh, right on. That actually kind of, uh, brings me to one point I was going to get to, but now can combine the whole film just sounds so collaborative, which I'm sure was uh, very uh, edifying. Is that the right word? Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about in this film, but also all, all your films, sort of the relationship between you and the colorist and the production designer. Cause mm-hmm. I, I've said it for a while now that f- cinematography seems to be, have one foot squarely in the DI and one foot squarely on set. And then there's, the production designer who often uh, doesn't get as much credit as they deserve, in my opinion, you know, they'll say, like, I, oh, I, couldn't, great. And, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and to, to what you said before, um, I've always had good relationships with production designers and all of our venture movies, you know, minus fight club, it was always Don Burt and he and I love, you know, have a great friendship and, and work hand in hand. Uh, this really, this, this one with John Hutman and I, let me broadly say for the whole film, and it starts with Aaron's script, the fact that it's I Love Lucy, that we all, all of us have something connection to it. Uh, the cast and the producers created this wonderful kind of uh, environment. Everybody was into it. You know, it didn't matter if it was the fourth grip uh, holding on to a stand. Every day there was this integrity and wanting to succeed right. And, you know, we all take a little bit of credit because we create that environment. But I've never been on a set where everybody valued every position as much as they did and and put their best foot forward all the time. And that says a lot about Aaron and Stuart, our producer, and the cast and everybody. Uh, And they felt like it was something we were doing something special. You know, that just making something nice uh, that we all had, you know, and, and they all invested in it. So that said, uh, John and I, um, and going back to Aaron's, show me, show, you know, I hired you to do what you do, show me, and yeah. and then discuss. And so John and this I has had to feel great. <laughs> right. So John and I had these constant, you know, meetings and debates about things, about where to have things, and then ways to present them to make sure they put, you know, that, that the entire reasoning behind why this is a better place for us than something else, uh, uh, to present to Aaron. And it was great. And things like, um, there's a scene where Nicole and, uh, uh, Aaliyah have this great conversation. She says, you're an older woman and that's old comedy and this is young comedy and blah, blah, blah. And, And they, and like I said, we had them swap positions and swap positions. And it was a very narrow hallway. So the coverage was going to be complicated no matter what. But it was a dead hallway. And and I, I just like, John, can you make me a window at the end of this hallway? And he made a window and I put panels behind there. And they stand in front of that window. And that's one of the more beautiful scenes in the movie and heartfelt and connected. Like, because it's all right there. You're seeing it. There's no, there's no cheating of anything. And, uh, and and changing doors that were solid doors to glass doors so that there was depth in rooms and uh, practicals and window dressings and 
let's shoot that this place doesn't work, but this place looks great. And we had a great time. We had really fun. And, uh, you know, Aaron's very generous and he often says that he, that John Hartman and I are, are co-authors of the, of the success of that movie. I think that's a lot too generous, but, um, uh, it, it was definitely a team effort. Yeah. Talk to me about, uh, how, sort of how you're shooting again, going to the DI question is how are you working with your oh, colorist and, okay. uh, and, and what are you shooting? <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I, I, I'm loving everything. Uh, but how are you kind of shooting on set versus what you're doing in, in the grade? You know, or is it kind yeah. of like what you see is what you get and then just a little tweaking or is it a little more, uh, technical, you know, sometimes like shoot high, bring it down, that kind of thing. No, I, I, I tend to try to do as much as I can in camera and, and walk, leave this, the, the set that day with as much of it done as possible. Um, but there are of course things that, you know, and you, you, you know, you're, uh, efficient with your time. And if there's something that is taking, it's going to take the grips two hours to knock that little highlight down in the ceiling. I can get that later in right. five minutes. I, I'm not going to waste time doing that. Uh, it, it, uh, Ian Vert, Vertovec at Line Iron and I have done about seven movies together, I think. And so we have this great understanding and aesthetically we're really matched up once, once we kind of dictate what this film wants to be and discover that, then it's such an easy thing getting there. And then it's just, it's fun actually. Then it's just a matter of like matching this and a little bold and sitting back and go, okay, let's watch it in its entirety now because you can get lost in yourself and going like, this is this and this, and this. And then you watch the movie and go, Oh wait, hang on. This is too heavy for this part. And this, there's the, the movie's not balanced in, in its entirety. Like we've got to do this. And, and that's, that's really when you get fine tuning in, into it, but it's an enormous part of it. He's, he's, he should be sitting on that dolly right next to me, you know, because that's how important that role comes. Uh, uh, when you're finishing, you know, I, yeah. I spent on this movie, it was a little longer than normal. I think I usually get about eight or nine days and this movie turned out to be about 19 or 20. And that was a lot to do with, uh, beauty fixes and things like that. Yeah. And, um, so which depending on the, the budget of your film and the visual effects departments and all the people above some more and more of that is seems to me it's falling on us in the DI. Um, I, I could be wrong about that. You know, when, when we were color correcting this movie, it was like the highlight of COVID, but after production had come back, literally nobody was available. Like literally it was taking weeks to get effect shots back and cause uh, production had just flooded them. You know, we had shut down for a few months and then everything started up again and then it all was coming to a head at the same time. Yeah. The, there's also a wonderful color compression, I guess you'd call it, uh, in the film. Where and is that? How much of that is leaning on like makeup and and obviously the sets and stuff, and how much of that is is di? Mm -hmm. um, I think going into the movie, we talk about the colors and and how saturated they are, uh, and what how we want them represented in the end. But I and Ian over the years have kind of a lot that we love a look, you know, I wouldn't say it's a number, but, uh, especially I did something a few years ago with Mark Romantic called tales from the loop. And I love that show. That was great. Uh, cheers. Thank you. Uh, and I, I loved the way that color was rendered in that. And I loved the saturation or slight desaturation of colors and muted colors. And, um, we just brought that over and we started there with this and then, went forward you know um it was funny when i was doing tales from the loop i was in canada and i was using the dxl2 which was the new newer dxl and i had called light iron back because light iron and panavision had merged together i'm like uh I, I think i like this lot um tell me the pros and cons and you say <laughs> guy starts laughing on the phone he goes well that's your lot from social network that we incorporated into the camera. So that's probably why you like it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. And you didn't guess, get a kickback for that or nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's whatever. That's, but uh, anyways, that was fun. Cause that's, that's why I gravitated towards that 
to start with. But um, yeah, I, I, it, we, we set those looks and desaturated things, but I think the colors were not that vivid to start with. You know, mm-hmm. we kind of went into it uh, knowing like not too stark, not to this. We weren't making something like, you know, we weren't doing Pee Wee Herman's big right. top where his color was so imperative. You know, ours is more subdued and, and I'd say it was 50, 50 between us uh, in the DI and, and what the stylist had, had costume or had already uh, conceived. Yeah. The, the only reason I ask, I mean, not the only reason, but the, one of the reasons why I ask is uh, I've just been over COVID. My project was to learn basic coloring. You know, obviously I'm not mm-hmm. a colorist. I would never say that, but uh, got decent at it. And so I'm always wondering like how much, how much of this can I squeeze out, you know, not trying to quote unquote fix it and post, but just learn, you know, where, where are the limitations? What, what can I lean on? What can't I lean on? So it's cool to hear kind of like, no, but it changes too. Like your wide shot's going to be one thing, and you when you're pushing into a close up like you and I, I then you're going to slightly adjust that so because it's going to have in the in the black level, which affects the color, is going to be slightly different to the way it's saturated and not. So it's a it's a give and take the whole time. But yeah, yeah. Um, I I do have a handful more questions, but we've kind of come up on time, and I don't want to uh, ask a few. Day. Go for it. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> I did, uh, I did want to know what your, I guess it's, this is more of a technical question, but I know you shot on the, uh, the Monstro with the DNA primes, which is mm-hmm. a cool combo. Um, but I was wondering what sort of, what, uh, gets you excited about red. You know, most people are like, Oh, I, I feel like the knee jerk reaction to do something like this would be on Alexa. Um, I know you have a relationship with red, but are we at the point where it doesn't matter, but or, you know, what, what draws you to that camera system so much? Well, uh, one, the relationship, of course, uh, since the onset of the, that camera, we've been involved in it. And Fincher and I, uh, and I still think him today, you know, I think he's doing a film right now that uh, Eric Messerschmidt is shooting. And I think they have a prototype on that as well. And it's like we always had the, the newest version of, of technology along the way. Um, I love the way it renders color. I, I kind of come from the same camp that Fincher does in that uh, I would rather have too much information and too much detail and step on it later than not have enough. Uh, Mm -hmm. I certainly think that the Alexa is a beautiful camera and the Sony Venice is a beautiful camera and I've shot with both and I'm not, I I use them as well. Um, It's just a familiarity thing, but uh, I do to, I do think the cameras are really, really close now, but it's just a matter of lens choices and f- finite like details that you want to make one work harder for than the other. Um, which is why everyone's obsessed with glass now and, you know, getting older glass and rehousing older glass, you know, the, the, the more resolution and the better the chips get, it's like, we might as well shoot through Coke bottles to try <laughs> to get some, texture back into you know the images right so Mm -hmm. so uh i i don't think you can go wrong anymore i do i do actually i i i would be surprised if anyone's asked you this but uh what would i primarily shoot on canon those are just the cameras that Mm -hmm. i don't the the cinema cameras and i know you shot a short on the c500 did um do you remember anything that maybe i could uh steal from you any tips on exposing that sensor or shooting in all, in, all, in all fairness that was a prototype and it had cables hanging out no back on it and they had a, <laughs> a gaggle of engineers in a temp tent that i wasn't allowed to go into doing oh, things really? and i i kind of like i did i took the job and it was a, a commercial i didn't know we were shooting on that camera and mm. so when that camera came about i was like fine but then it better do uh, what it's supposed to be doing since I'm being asked to make this great show. It was a short. And, uh, and so I kept pushing it really hard and they go, are you sure you want it to be that contrast? And like, if your toy doesn't work, <laughs> that's on you. Not my fault. And like, yeah. no, 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 no. And in the end, it absolutely gorgeous. Like I was very happy with what, what, what we got. Show. It's nice, nice piece. Look good. And uh, I think cameras, you know, I think the camera at that time wasn't in the same league as Alexa and the Reds, you know, and I don't think 
uh, Sony had anything. You know, the Venice wasn't out for another couple of years, but but I think that the, that that Canon is awesome. I think it's a fantastic you know choice. To, and again, you just have to pick the best tools for that project. You know, and the, yeah. and each in each time it's different. And for me, it's usually I'm changing lenses more than I'm changing cameras, but I'll change cameras too, depending on, on what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. No point in limiting yourself. No. Um, I, I did want to briefly touch on your music video history because mm-hmm. um, you. It's not brief. Were, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, take all the time you want, man. I, uh, but the, that era of music videos is just so um, influential, I think for a lot of people. And you know, when I was kind of coming out of college, I was looking back on people I admired, you know, your Spike Joneses and your Chris Cunningham's and you guys and uh, going like, well, I should get into music videos and commercials, but the landscape had completely changed. And I'm wondering what your perspective is on kind of what that era of sort of filmmaking was for music videos compared to kind of what it is now when I know you still make music videos from time to time um, and kind of how, how those differ from each other. Uh, it was before Napster and record companies were making a lot of music money on music and artists were willing to spend their money on music videos. And the ones that were winning were Madonna's Michael Jackson's who put as much effort into the videos as, as everybody else did. You certainly had a lot of artists that would come in and it was a nuisance to them and they'd walk away. Thing was that they that came out of their profits you know and so it was always odd to me that someone didn't invest as much as everybody else was on the set um but it was it was fantastic you had all these young filmmakers no boundaries enormous amounts of money all trying to outdo each other with no rules and so some ideas were not so great and some were just amazing and every week you didn't know what was going to happen you know um uh, Jake Scott does uh, a video in reverse, the whole the whole uh, video, or Stefan Sednui would do something crazy, people walking on ceilings, or Mark Romanek doing something bold, or Ventures with Madonnas, or uh, it just was like the Wild West for a while, and embracing all kinds of new technology that was coming out at the same time, um, periscope lenses and uh different cranes and ways to get on and off of things and all kinds of crazy stuff uh opening the camera while rolling and shooting on uh uh uh, black and white sound recording tape to try to get some energy or even harris savita's baking film for the whole video you know where he put film in the oven and let it start to come delaminated from itself and then shot with that and you got all the splatching and you know interactive stuff like that. I mean, I, I, Harris and I, uh, Harris shot an additional couple of weeks of seven. I operated on second unit on seven and then all the additional footage and then split up and shot third unit footage. And then he and I were shooting the title sequence together of, of seven with all the fingers and all the little stuff. Right. And out of that footage, I got a couple of music videos where they ripped off just oh the, the title sequence and scratching and details and a weirdo in his apartment, you know, serial serial killer type stuff. And so I did a couple of those too. Um, And then Napster happened and uh, everybody was lost. Like music was free and there was no profit to be made. And uh, what's the point of music videos? And it took a few years for everybody to figure out how to monetize again. And nowadays like kids are buying videos off the internet. So you know, iTunes and dollar twenty five, and you get a music video of Taylor Swift. So there's certain artists that are reinvesting in the videos. You know, uh, I get to do one or two a year, and they always seem to have a decent amount of money. They'll never have the money that they did before Napster, and uh, but but there are good artists and good directors that are making really quality work, and I I hope that bigger artists start coming back more and investing more in their videos. You know, Beyonce always makes great videos and uh, different artists will still do that. And I think that the, the rewards, financial rewards are there. So it won't be what it was, but I do think that it's growing back into a comfortable spot to, to, to still be relevant. 
Yeah. Well, it goes back to what we were saying about like, you know, the punk rockiness of things and like pushing mm-hmm. the boundaries, that wild west attitude. Do you see kind of that um, mindset being applied anywhere else in the industry or maybe even outside the industry? Anything kind of exciting like that for you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I still think that kids are doing it in videos. I still think that uh, uh, the music video world has expanded internationally. I think all filmmaking has expanded internationally. I've gone to Poland to be a judge on film uh, music video festival before and and the directors are from every part of the world and it's it's amazing and the stories are amazing because they're influenced by their cultures and so the different perspectives you know it's still kids and still hip music but the influences are 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 fascinating and what they think is important and how they light things and some of them are absolutely beautiful and smart stories and stuff so i think for what we lost we gained by the internet and the ability to to have so many more opportunities to present things, you know, when I say present, I mean like whether it's on the internet or YouTube or podcast or cable or television, there's just so many more platforms that need content now that it opens the door for a lot of uh, young filmmakers or old filmmakers. You know, I had a guy come watch me. He called and uh, ASC has an apprentice program where they shadow you on set or shadow you on post or just uh, mentor a little bit. And I said, uh, I had done it a couple of times before. And he said, sure. I like, I read his thing and like, great. And he did it. And he came to watch me do the DI and he's older than me, but he's Mm -hmm. uh, a cinematographer. He's making great low budget movies. He's been a fan. He wanted to see how to get to the next level. And it's like, hell yeah, why not? Yeah. The, uh, the mentorship, from the ASC like I've interviewed a good handful of ASC members and uh, they all they kind of exude that um, I guess willingness or, or enthusiasm to shepherd in the next generation and, and I love it you know I was apprehensive at first because I hate all these kids that know more about it than I do but uh, <laughs> sure <laughs> they embarrass me but uh or ask me questions i can't answer but uh i did it a couple times now it's it's so rewarding and wonderful and uh the spirit and energy is is uh intoxicating so why wouldn't you want to uh involve yourself with that yeah I, I, to that point um i've never done this but i'm trying to expand the the scope of this podcast to mm-hmm. disciplines around cinematography and i know you spent um what was it? Ten years as a as an AC. I uh, did. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for for ACs who might be listening, or maybe people getting into ACing, or or maybe even seasoned ones? That's funny. Usually, it's it's questions about how to be a DP uh, or cinematographer. But um, yeah, I mean, if you want if you want to go the craftsman's route, which I did, which I think was, I think each person has to decide what works best for them. For me, I'm a little bit of a slow learner. I need to absorb it and watch it and then apply it myself. So, uh, uh, yeah. And so, uh, and, and in doing that, you know, I got to work on movies I never would have got to work on if I just came out of the world starting to shoot. I got to do the biggest movies and watch the, the smartest guys solve those problems, which helped me enormously. Um, I would just say, be around cameras. I would say go to rental houses, uh, uh, volunteer to work for a camera assistant or a second, drive the truck, get on set, learn how the set uh, ethics work and what your roles are and how to learn more. Uh, be over supportive. Ask people if they want something. Ask the first AD if uh, he needs coffee. Because when you're showing initiative like that, people look at you different than they looked at all the other five or 10 PAs that are standing on set not doing anything or trying to sneak off to hide somewhere. If someone wants to be a filmmaker, then show your filmmaking. And even though it seems beneath you at the moment, it has it has feet. And uh, people told me that was young. Be eager. Be the one that that stays the longest, that offers to, to drive someone home, that puts the, the whatever it is away, the last person. Um, and and you will get the first call and then you get the next call. And then when you change, you go, well, I'm not a, fir- I'm not a loader, a PA or a loader anymore. I'm a second. You're like, great. I got a job for you now because they trust in you as the person you've shown them your character. Uh, and then technologically just, you know, and experience wise, surround your around surround yourself around people that are doing it, that are working, that are good, and you'll absorb that. You know, um, one thing that tends to 
it still does to this day. Uh, if you can get on a TV show, uh, especially some kind of action show, um, you're forced to learn a lot and see a lot of different techniques and move quickly and absorb a lot in a short amount of time. And it happens every day and it happens every day for 90 days or however long the show is. And by the time you get out of that, you've gone through boot camp and you've absorbed all this stuff. Seriously, it's a beating. But yeah. I, have a, I have a second that wants to be a first who has worked with me since, since Social Network. And he had a chance to go shoot the uh, seal team or to be an assistant on seal team on third camera i'm like 100 you got to go do that and i would check on him he goes it's hard but i'm i'm always have the longest lens i always you know because that's what third guy does he has the hardest shot longest lens and you know uh i used him the other day on a commercial and i was i was beyond shocked like it was a close-up like this and it was a last second thing like, hey, can you come do this? And this person's leaning back and forth. And he was like, zh, 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 spot on. Like, there it is. Yeah, I'm sure you suffered. I'm sure it was hard. I'm sure it was fun. But that knowledge that you absorbed on that, you can't, you can't get it anywhere else. And that makes you valuable. All you want to be is valuable to an assistant that will go on the movies with you, the operator that tags you along with him for every movie he does with that DP or the DP. And then... Once you have that, you're off. Yeah, free to free to travel the world, as uh, Southwest says. Yeah, I mean it, it's truly. I mean everyone has said this a billion times, but it is truly not a place for ego. You're you're no. helping the team. It's all a team. It is a team sport. Filmmaking is everyone coming together. Exactly. Um, really appreciate your time. Normally, I I uh, ask two questions at the end, but mm-hmm. having done a bunch of research with from you and a few other guys I interviewed, uh, I seem to be asking the same question that every other podcast does. So that's out. Um, okay. So I got two new ones. Uh, well, one new one and then one that's actually bad. But uh, the first one, speaking of that sort of history and lineage of film, is there a good resource that you can recommend for people who are trying to um, make sure that they are uh, educated in, in where they come from, so to speak, and where they are now. Or I, You can't find a resource where you are now, but, uh, you know, like to, to help uh, solidify those sort of strands to the past creators. Mm. A book or something. Yeah, I, I don't have a, a book in particular, I think. I think that there's a lot of websites and a, and a lot of... Uh, you can go online and watch movies and listen to the talk people talk about them. I mean, to me, if it was me and you asked like, what would I do? I think I'd look like on IMDb's like top 50 movies and watch them and watch the behind the scenes and listen to Coppola talk about the Godfather and listen to uh, uh, Milo talk about one flew over the cuckoo's nest or talk about, um, you know, even Lucas talk about star Wars or something. And, Learn what those guys went through and had to uh, watch Heart of Darkness. You really want to yeah. know like about a movie Jeez. and how hard and how hard movies are to make, um, and what people go through to get it. Like it's not all like uh, sushi and wine and uh, you know manicures and it's hard work and there's a lot of tantrums and a lot of personalities and a lot of babysitting. Not always. That's not always the way it is. You know, being the Ricardos was more or less um, us going to work and trying to make the best movie we can. There was not a whole lot of uh, hardship involved, but that's not, that's not normal. There's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of enormously talented people uh, put in, in fragile positions, you know, actors are exposed. Mm-hmm. They're naked all the time in front of you. And, and, uh, and you're asking them to lay out their themselves exposed and, and, and create these characters and, and there's all kinds of uh, stuff that goes on on sets that that um, aren't just the fundamentals of making the movie, but are necessary to possess in your toolbox of of tools to navigate through a set and and in the end get those shots. Because there's no disclaimers when that film starts. You know, it's it's just the shots you got. Nobody talks about who wouldn't come out of whose dressing room or whose makeup didn't work or the crane didn't show up or generator went out none of that it's just whoever has the best creative solutions to the dilemma of that day wins and everybody has dilemmas you know you watch uh private saving private ryan in the storming of normandy there's 
they shot that over four or five days on the coast of Normandy. There's changes in the light all day long. It's sunny, it's raining, it's windy, it's no, there's no clouds at all, it's back. But in the way of covering it and in the style they chose and in the kind of grain structure they created, you get lost in that. You're not looking at the, wait, that was cloudy, that's sunny, that's this or that. So you, nobody can control everything all the time. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Two things. One, I, uh, I've always said that we should do a behind the scenes streamer. Like there needs to be, cause yeah. you can get all the, all the movies you want, but like I've been on a Blu-ray, especially during the pandemic, just on a Blu-ray purchasing tear just to, you know, cause I, they're trying to take it away. You know, it's not on this yeah. streamer. Now it's on this one. Now it's nowhere. And you never get the directors. Like how easy would it be to do a director's commentary in the, you know, language selector, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's, but it is funny. You mentioned heart of darkness. Cause we watched that in film school and it was, we had to watch it over like two, three days, something like that. Cause it's kind of long. And I think on the second day I was reminded that I was watching a film about the making of apocalypse now and not a documentary about the, not the war <laughs> or yeah, because everybody in it was a combatant. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's a brutal, it's an excellent, uh, excellent documentary for anyone listening. Um, second question uh, being the Ricardos is in a double feature. What's the other film? Uh, good question. Um, I'll just, I'm just going to say Peggy Sue got married because it's the same genre. My dad photographed it. It's uh, a beautiful film. Coppola directed it. Uh, there you go. That, that's, that's probably it. not a great answer, but it's a close to the hard answer. That's no, that's the, that's the best answer. Um, again, man, thank you so much for your time. It was really awesome talking to you and, uh, I'm happy to have you back next time you do wait, wait, another thing. Predator thermal. versus alien. Alien. <laughs> oh, alien. I meant at the double screening. <laughs> oh, the, oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm just I was like, trying right, to be I'll take as this. far away from what should be there as possible. Predator yeah. versus alien. <laughs> oh man or like uh what was that one predator 2000 or something like that when they were putting numbers and all the a per, uh, per, pariah wasn't there a movie about the uh, piranha piranha yeah sharknado, yeah, yeah. sharknado. You could do Shark, yeah. sharknado and being the ricardo's yeah. would be pretty good yeah. perfect <laughs> yeah um cool man well i'll let you go uh like i said uh next time you do something please come back because i'd love to talk about it cheers thanks for having me man Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the Ethanart Mapbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>